Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Executive Compensation Podcast. In this episode of the Executive Compensation Podcast, we're going to be talking with Bob Romanchek all about the finalization of the 2010 Dodd-Frank Executive Compensation Rules. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Bob. Yeah, thank you. Happy to be here. It's great. So for the first question here, I'd like to ask, with all the activity in ESG and diversity, equity, and inclusion over the last year or two, can we look beyond this and consider if, is there any statutory activity that we should expect in the near future in terms of executive compensation? Yeah, it's a great question. I'm very happy to not only answer that, but the whole area and concept of ESG and DEI this is just about all boards and comp committees have been talking about for the last couple of years. Uh, the whole area, statutory changes in executive compensation has been relatively quiet. We had a little tax change with 162M under the Trump tax rules a couple of years back. Otherwise, it's been really proxy advisory firm, asset management firm, and really focused on ESG and DEI. So here, finally, not only do we have some statutory activity, we know about one that's going to happen, and it goes all the way back to the 2010 Dodd-Frank statute. There are a few hundred different sub-rules under Dodd-Frank, if you go back and think about what happened in 2010 with the financial meltdown. So the rules are really meant to add some additional security to the markets and shore up a few areas where they thought there were some problems. In particular, executive compensation, they added independence rules, which, which were implemented by companies immediately. So comp committees, their advisors, including Meridian, are subject to these six independence rules. That, that was famous and done. Interestingly, there are still two executive compensation related items, very material, which still haven't been finalized. And here we are at the back end of 2021, all these years later, and uh, still not done. And frankly, all that needs to happen, Congress need not get involved anymore. The rule is, it's the law, it is a statute. Simply, we need final regulation posted in the final register after about a 60 day typical comment period and another 30 days for the SEC to consider. That's it when that comment period expires, unless they retract again and add some more changes, the rules are finalized. And these are two very important. It's the clawback rules and it's the pay for performance, which is a new proxy disclosure uh, requirement that uh, I'm anxious to tell you a little bit more about. So. That's great. And so can you give us a bit of history on these Dodd-Frank clawback rules and where we might end up? Right, right. So between the two uh, unfinished Dodd-Frank rules, the clawback is absolutely the big, most material one. It's going to uh, impact every public company out there. Most organizations, when Dodd-Frank came out in 2010, uh, and saw these requirements, most actually put in clawback provisions to the extent they didn't have them already. They were all caveated, however, with the sentence that uh, this, these rules are intended to fulfill the requirements under Dodd-Frank. However, because we don't have the Dodd-Frank rules, you really don't know if you're in compliance. So once we get the rules, there's, there's gonna be things to do and everybody's gonna have to review and probably revise. But if you look all the way back to 2002, Sarbanes-Oxley, we had clawbacks by statute in the Sarbanes Oxley rules, but they only went to two executives, CEO and CFO. They went back one year. You actually needed negligence to do a clawback. So these rules did not have a lot of teeth to them. And, and Congress and others thought we needed something that was a little more requiring. And thus, when you get to 2010 under Dodd Frank, we now have statutory clawback there under that statute. And uh, although we don't know the rules, if you look at the actual statute, it literally is three sentences long about clawbacks. And it does say it covers all your current and preceding executives. Uh, if there's a financial restatement, incentive compensation, including stock options, that's one detail we have, is clawed back to the extent excess was paid above what should have been paid. That's it. There is no more to the statute. So all the rules requirements come under the regulation. So essentially the SEC needs to write those uh, to give us all direction on what the statute, how you would actually interpret that. And what happened back in 2015, the SEC actually came out with proposed regulations in both of these areas. And they were so, uh, what is the word? There are so many issues that were generated based on the proposed regulations, which is essential. There's so many very complex things here. Uh, concerning you know, what exactly does three years mean? What value gets clawed back? Is that different for different vehicles? 
Um, what if you're no longer employed? What's the process with the board, the governance committee, the comp committee? There are many, many very significant issues that need to be addressed. And in 2015, when those rules came back, uh, such uh, uh, reflection and, and comment letters came in so many, the SEC pretty well sat on it and never finalized those rules. So we have a very good clue of what they were thinking about at least 2015. But now here we are a, a number of years later, uh, we now have a Democrat majority uh, on the SEC committee. So you would think those rules might be drafted slightly different. We just came out of the Republican administration and they, they didn't finalize those rules. Of course, writing regulations, that's not a very exciting thing. And they had other things, I guess, to keep them occupied. So here we are and what, what's happened here? Why are we talking about this? The SEC very recently did something very interesting. So they posted on the internet publicly for all of us to see a calendar of high priority items that they're going to address. The unusual thing they did is they actually provided a targeted date of when we expect these regulations. So for both the clawback and the pay for performance rules, uh, they identified April of 2022 as the target date to uh, release these regulations. Note, there's nothing in the statute that requires them to come out by any particular date. And of course, we've been waiting since 2010. So um, I think that's uh, some assurance that we'll see something around there, but it's not guaranteed. So there is high expectation that they've created that those rules will come out and then we're all gonna have to say, have, have some work to do at that point in time. That's great. And uh, thank you for sharing all those insights. It's really interesting to hear just, yeah, the, I guess what is coming and uh, all the communication from the SEC on that. Um, can you also explain the pay versus performance Dodd-Frank expected rules as well? Right, right. So uh, with the objective of, of, of shining light on issues rather than regulating, that's how they approach this particular issue. And what the SEC was trying to do, actually Congress in the statute, the Dodd-Frank statute, again, going back to 2010, that's where this rule also emanates. It basically says in your proxy, you must disclose pay of your of your NEOs and related company performance. But similar to the clawback rules, the statute itself is only about two sentences long. It barely, barely gives us any clues. It doesn't specifically define what performance is, doesn't specifically define pay. But once again, 2015, along with clawback, we got proposed regulations in this area as well. So if you look at those regulations, we have a very good idea of at least at that point in time what the SEC was thinking. And very specifically, they required a new table in the proxy statement that showed your, your CEO and a line item by him or herself with their pay compared to performance. And they want to prove up that relationship that pay is in alignment. And that's kind of the old mantra that you really want. Uh, the difficulty here is the way they've defined pay in the proposed regulations 2015 is different than the pay that is disclosed in the summary comp table in the same proxy. So they, they've modified the definition of long-term incentives, stock options in particular, and also the pension uh, disclosure in the summary comp table. And because of that, you have two different pay numbers that you're gonna be looking at in the same proxy for the CEO. Uh, and then for performance, uh, they focused on relative or not relative, just total stock return, TSR, which is stock price performance plus dividends. It's a known quantity. You can, could get that information any given day because it's public stock price. So it's an easy calculation and thus a good proxy for performance. However, there are many ways you can measure performance of a company. In some industries, stock price is not always the best measure for that, or it's one of multiple. But at this point, at least in the regs, they focused on TSR. We don't know if you, they'll allow you to do multiple uh, different means of that, but it looks like it's TSR. So you put your CEO pay as modified compared to your TSR, and here's where this starts getting a little complicated. It's over a five-year period. However, proxy disclosure for your named executive officers only goes back three years. So they've created disclosure that goes back two years farther than proxy disclosure. There is a transition period up front where it starts at three and each year adds another year. Uh, that's number one. And number two, then TSR, <clears throat> you've got to create a peer group that is relative to you so you can compare your TSR to the peer group. Now you may already have a peer group for external market benchmarking of value of compensation for your executives. You may have a TSR peer group uh, if you've got performance shares or performance-based long-term incentive to measure the performance relative. And so now here's a third reason why you need a performance peer group. 
They may all three be the same, they may all three be different, but that's just one of the additional complications. And there's a hole in the regulations, it's a pay for performance and you're looking at a peer group, but they never say you need to provide then the pay of the CEOs of those targeted peer groups. So you're, it's kind of missing the actual pay part of the equation. But the real difficulty is then beyond the CEO, for the next four, typically organizations have five executives in the proxy statement. For the next four, they simply average them all together. So it really eliminates any meaningful comparison by executive job. So you've got four jobs and the pay is averaged to compare to performance. And I'm not sure what benefit we're gonna get out of that. A true measure of pay for performance by, by job is kind of lost by doing that. So again, there's a lot of complication here. Almost nobody has even attempted to model these out because number one, we don't have the final rules. And number two, it's simply disclosure. So it's busy work, new disclosure. And these rules also on the SEC calendar, guess what, are scheduled to come out in April of 2022. So both clawback and paper performance, if uh, the SEC stays true to their targeted release date, we are all in the executive compensation world and have a lot of work to do in addressing both of these new uh, statutory rules uh, beyond ESG. Great, and so uh, what should companies be doing now in anticipation of these final regulations? Right, so this, this is really an interesting question. You know a new law is coming out and it's only months away. The answer is probably not much. On pay for performance, it's senseless to attempt to model that. They've got to give us more of the requirements to really be able to do that, but it's not a useful model. It's not like you would use that for other corporate performance purposes. So nothing to do there, just kind of follow the, the disclosure and, and so we can comply. The clawback, this is gonna be a real issue. So what do you do now? Um, you don't wanna go back in and change or modify your clawback right now in anticipation of unknown new rules. That's the last thing you should do. However, you should take inventory. Some organizations have put their clawbacks in their long-term incentive award agreements. Some are in the annual bonus, some are hard-coded otherwise. So you should really simply get an inventory of what you have, what it says, how it works, what the process is, Again, is it the full board of all, the, and the governance committee and the comp committee? You know, if you have a clawback for a top executive officer, you think that would be true. And particularly with those proposed regulation going back three years and includes all executive officers. And it goes back, even officers that have recently left during the pay period, it picks those up as well. So you've just got to understand what your clawback currently says. You might compare it to the proposed regs in 2015, but I would say hold off. And uh, we should just simply wait for the new regs to come out in April. That's great. Well, thank you for taking the time to share all this, Bob. Any other final words of wisdom for all the companies out there um, before we wrap up here? Yeah, make sure you are compliance with the SEC's uh, soon to release the ESG requirements, but get ready for the statutory Dodd-Frank requirements here, clawbacks, favor performance. Great. Thank you for taking the time to come on here today, Bob. All right, you're welcome. Thank you for having me.